here this afternoon or this evening as a learning community with parents, friends, relatives, students, staff, and faculty in celebration of your hard work and willingness to open your minds and learn new things. Now, our former chancellor, Pam Schocker Saddleback, used to play a little game. It was called, Did You Know? And every time she would say we would play this game of Did You Know, I would learn something about the campus that I didn't know. So let's, let's do a little round of Did You Know right now, okay? Did you know that the School of Public Affairs is ranked by US News and World Report as a top 100 School of Public Affairs in the United States of America? How many people did that? You did. All right. See, so they're learning stuff already. So you thought when you graduate, you're going to stop learning? No way. <laughs> did you know that UCCS graduates have the lowest school loan default rate in a five state region? The federal? Yeah. Good news, parents, right? The, especially if you don't sign. The, um, <laughs> the uh, federal loan default rate is about 13%. The Colorado loan default rate is about 15%. Anybody want to guess if you don't know? If you, if you know, don't say so. But if, if you don't know, anybody want to guess as to what the loan default rate is at UCCS? Throw out a number. 8%. That would be good, wouldn't it? 2.7%. 2.7%. Did you know that the University of Colorado system produces more graduate degrees than any other university in Colorado? Yes, we are one of four campuses of a single university. The university is the University of Colorado. We just happen to be the fastest growing campus in that system with over 13,000 students on our way to 50,000 students. Someday, with 550 acres to build on on this campus, I am confident we will have 50,000 students in this Yes, that is bigger than Boulder. We have, um, we're growing, our county, El Paso County, is growing at a rate of 100,000 new residents every 10 years. That bodes well for our growth. It's almost automatic in that sense. And the next building that will go up on Nevada Avenue will be the William J. Hibble Sports Medicine Center. An amazing building. It's going to be even bigger than the End Center for the Performing Arts that wow. you saw on North Nevada. And that is expected to bring in over 1,000 new students studying exercise science. This is a happening place. It really is. Now, ours is a professional school. It's not a liberal arts institution. Our ultimate objective is not to serve academia. And it's not our highest achievement to provide professors for the academy. We don't hold as our highest principle knowledge merely for knowledge's sake, although that is noble in itself. But we labor specifically to prepare others for entry into the criminal justice and public sector professions. We strive to prepare professionals who will not only serve their own goals and objectives, but who will first and foremost serve the public good. The Roman poet Virgil said it well, the noblest motive is the public good. Now none of you here will cross the commencement stage as a result of your solitary effort. I ask you now to think about those who encouraged you, who guided you, in some cases financed you, or even suffered for you to reach this day. Please join me in a round of applause for the parents, the donors, the spouses, the funders, and all of those who are part of this day, whether they're present or not. One of the things that makes your graduation so remarkable is how few actually complete the arduous path to higher education. Mm -hmm. Only 33.5% of Americans hold a bachelor's degree. 33.5%. Only 8.5% achieve a master's degree. Regardless of your origins or your socioeconomic status, 
By virtue of graduation from this university, you have joined the ranks of the educated. Now the truth is, a degree does not make you one bit smarter or better than anyone else. We know this. My father was the smartest man I ever knew, but he did not have the opportunity to get a degree. He used to caution me by saying, now George, don't become one of those educated fools. <laughs> so I pass that charge to you. Don't just be educated, be wise. Don't assume that you're better than others, just strive to be better, a better version of yourself. That promises to be a lifetime of work for your cause. Now let me say a word about some in this audience who are exceptionally proud of you, the faculty and our hardworking staff members. The faculty is the heart and soul of any academic institution. It's beautiful buildings are but hollow shells without the faculty that makes the university come alive. Their work is never done. There are always papers to be graded, research to be conducted, grants to be pursued, and courses to prepare for. I think it's fair to say that every faculty member in this school could make more money in another line of work, yet they labor on, sustained by your accomplishments. And let me add that nothing gets done at UCCS without our exceptional staff that labors so hard for our collective success. So why do they do it? Well, because of you, our students. They care about you, and they glory in your potential and what you will accomplish when you leave this institution. Please join me in a round of applause for their contributions. <laughs> so speaking of commitment and loyalty, it's now my pleasure to bring to the microphone Dr. Anna Kozlowski, who is going to present our Alpha Phi Sigma and Dr. Kozlowski. and as the uh, advisor to the CJ Honor Society, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our newest inductees, some of whom are graduating and we're celebrating with you here today. Uh, feel free to stand up when I say your name. Crystal Atkins. Kia Bates. Christopher Brinkley. Janae Chavez. Jordan Evenson. Stephen Cool, Matthew Lunger, Brianna Martinez, Christian Murley, Renee Schwartz, Anna Sharon, and Sarah Patea. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> this year they joined a national chapter of scholars, of practitioners, and alumni, and will be forever connected to a network of criminal justice folks. <laughs> and we're very excited to have you. Congratulations again. So every year we select an outstanding uh, BACJ student or Bachelor of Criminal Justice student of the year. It is with great honor that I announce our Bachelor of Criminal Justice student, Outstanding Student Award, to Miss Ashley Demosthenes. values the university holds in high esteem, including but not limited to collaboration, inclusiveness, integrity, and integration. At her core, she is a team player. It's clear that she genuinely enjoys working with others, finds value in collaboration, and realizes that we are generally stronger together. Her faculty members routinely comment about how Ashley is a positive presence in the classroom, <laughs> she works well with others on assignments, and I have found this to be true even beyond the classroom. She's employed on our contract with the Department of Colorado of Corrections, where she often assumes leadership roles under tasks. She encourages her uh, co-workers, helps them stay organized, helps us stay organized, and she makes sure that everyone finds their voice within the group. She's an example of inclusivity, She's a great colleague, a team member. 
She, academic excellence, I think, embodies uh, her performance in the classroom. And Ashley, you're going to be deeply missed. Congratulations on being selected as this year's outstanding BACJ student.
I just got back from, um, as John was explaining, just got back from Baltimore yesterday. And I met my new team, new faculty and staff that I'll be working with in the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Mm -hmm. And the best way I could describe my experience is that they mirror us. They have actually an um, enrollment rate around the same rate as we do. Um, they have a very cohesive, family-like oriented unit at their School of Public Policy. However, there is one distinct difference that I noticed, and the difference is this, is that um, you guys are my family. And three years ago, I had the pleasure of being adopted by the School of Public Affairs. Um, Dr. Ryan can attest to this, as well as Dr. Kloskowski, Evan, and the rest of my team, as well as my partners, the Colorado Department of Corrections. So um, to add on to John's points, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for being a part of my life and a part of my career. Um, I will never be able to repay the experiences that I've had the pleasure of having with each and every one of you. So, thank you. I'm Don Klingner, the director of the Masters in Public Administration program and a distinguished professor here at UCCS. It is a pleasure to have all of you here today. It's a pleasure not only to have the students but their families. Because getting through a master's program or any academic program is a community effort. You have to, before you enroll in it, think about the consequences for the people that you love and get their support. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And that's my introduction to our student of the year, Courtney Lynn. We have many qualified students, well-qualified students for the Student of the Year Award. But Courtney Lynn accomplished something that I can't even imagine. I didn't do it when I went through my master's program. She achieved a 4.0 grade point average, working with every faculty member in the program except me. <laughs> <laughs> I met her for the first time tonight. <laughs> but I also met her younger brother and her parents. And Khalil Gibran said something once, wrote it. God loves the arrow because the arrow flies far and it goes into the heavens. But God also loves the archer and the foe that sends the arrow forth. So what I'd like to do is to call Courtney up here to accept the Student of the Year Award and to invite her parents and her younger brothers to stand and receive our applause. <clears throat> Thank you. 
academics and also their community engagement. Master's students that earn membership have completed more than um, half of the credit hours to the program and have done it with a GPA of more than 3.7 or higher. It is the School of Public Affairs privilege to honor the following attendees with the symbols of membership, including a certificate and a course of pen. Before I welcome this year's honorees, um, will I pass Pi Alpha Alpha members, please stand and be recognized. As you can see, our members include both faculty, community, and school alumni. This year's honorees include Charlie McTavish, James Kinney, and Jessica. Most of my life in here in Colorado Springs, 
and I am anxious to hear um, the full reflection on leadership in a time of transition as communities across the United States and also the globe continue to struggle with civic discourse and around the issues of race, ethnicity, immigration, and community identity. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Rosemary Pettis. but has an office in Denver, Colorado. Uh, the American Civil Liberties Union that is based in New York, New York, but has an office for Colorado in Denver, uh, and now Positive Impact Colorado. Uh, this program prepared me for that list of not just names of organizations, but opportunities to serve. So we titled this talk Race, Policing, and Why Black Lives Should Matter to the Leader in You. Race, Policing, and Why Black Lives Should Matter to the Leader in You. And I know that those who graduate from this program are indeed leaders, ready to take their positions in society. Uh, I had no idea what a huge topic, race, policing, and why black lives should matter to the leader in you really was. Uh, as I started to do a, a lit review, I know that phrase rings true for those who just finished those last papers. Uh, as I started to do that, I found out two things. That there is literally too much that has been written, uh, I'll say in the last five years, on race and policing for me to have read in a week since I decided that that would be the title of the talk. What I also found, and I believe this is really true, is that the second part of that title, Why Black Lives Should Matter to the Leader in You, has not been written by anyone. Those words together, coming up in any kind of legitimate search, do not exist. And so I really believe that we're even treading newer ground. You're treading great new ground for your personal lives and your professional lives, and I think we're treading wonderful new ground for the success of our communities and indeed of our country as we talk about why black lives should matter to the leader in you. Uh, literally, uh, I did not know at 528 a week ago today 
that in the next 24 hours, a young man whose name I had never heard, Jordan Edwards, would be killed by a police officer in Bath Springs, Texas. I did not know the name Jordan Edwards. I knew that, unfortunately, there might be, might possibly be, probably be, another person who would become a victim of over-policing and indeed police brutality, but not in the next 24 hours after we selected the royal we selected the title, which makes me think that there was something preordained uh, in that title, why black lives should matter to the leader in you. So some of this uh, we're gonna talk about, and some of this maybe we'll move over. Um, but I want you to promise yourself, the leaders who are in the room, to Google those words or do whatever legitimate searches you do why black lives must matter to the leader in you. And if you don't find anything like I didn't find anything, and if you don't get what you need here, get it for yourself one way or another, because it will matter to you. Why black lives must matter to the leader in you. Uh, I ask you to consider it. Uh, in this community, we don't have to go as far as Back Springs, Texas, uh, a place where Jordan Edwards' parents thought that they were moving to ensure that he would have a, the best life with their education, money, middle class American status, uh, and ability to find the right home. We know that it's tough to find homes anymore, especially around here. Uh, where all those things they thought would add up to providing the best life, lives for their three sons. I know that they thought about his graduating from high school and from college, like you're doing today, and taking his place in society and in community, like you're about to do. I know that they could not have known that someone named Rosemary Lido, who they never heard of, um, despite my status with the PSA, <laughs> <laughs> and my position as the former advisor of the scribe, which we used to call the scribble, uh, they had no, could have had no idea that this woman would be talking about the death of their darling son. I have a daughter. If you have a daughter or a son or a child who you care about, whether they're connected to you biologically or not, think about all of your hopes and dreams for these moments, these moments that are so important to us that we have to capture them in the video. I saw the videos. We have to capture them with our smartphones. Uh, and we have to capture them in our hearts. Think for a moment about that child that you love and think about what Jordan Edwards' family uh, is going through now. As a leader, think about those things. Why black lives must matter to the leader in you. As I said, we don't have to go as far as Back Springs, Texas to know about this cry that black lives must matter. I hope you've seen the NAACP surge uh, showing up for racial justice here in Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs Progressives, Colorado Springs CAN, the ACLU, the Pikes Peak Justice and Peace Commission, uh, and the long list of faith leaders who have stepped out to say that black lives must matter. And today we're saying it must matter to the leader in you. But I hope that you've seen that in community as we have talked about uh, another young man, Jesse Garcia, who at the end of a road rage, we kind of think of that as something that's just on TV, but it could happen right here on Nevada. A road rage incident would take the life of this promising young father at age 23. Right on Nevada, we don't have to go as far as Bash Springs, Texas. Uh, we could go only as far as Denver to see another person named Jesse, a young woman, Jesse Hernandez, who was killed by a police officer in much the same way as Jordan Edwards. She was in a car, driving a car, the car was moving. Uh, the police officer said that he thought he would be struck and killed by this car, that this 16-year-old child uh, 
when my daughter was 16, I called her a child. Sometimes I still say she's a child when she's married. Uh, that this 16-year-old child driving this car who was riddled with bullets and taken back to her parents in a way that they could never have imagined when I'm sure they kissed her that day. We kiss our children. We want to physically. Uh, we do so virtually, I believe, every day. We hug them. When we send them out the door, we have every expectation that their lives will matter enough that they'll return home to us. I know that the parents of Jesse Hernandez expected her to come home that night, and she came home never again in the condition that she left. Uh, as I said, we don't have to go as far. We can look again at Colorado Springs and the recent settlement of a case uh, with our Colorado Springs Police Department and two young black men who were military, well-connected, uh, hopeful about their lives in the way that we all are. Uh, but in an encounter with the police, experience not just over-policing us, I know the criminal justice majors in the room will call it, uh, but a form of brutality that resulted in the ACLU taking their case and then winning a huge settlement on their behalf. I don't believe that money pays for those egregious injustices. Jesse Hernandez and Dipper, her family recently received a $5 million settlement uh, in her death at the hands of police. Uh, we know that the Brown brothers right here received a settlement from the city of Colorado Springs. They could have, could have certainly been going to some of our other many needs in this community. Uh, we don't yet know what's going to happen with the case of Jesse Garcia, but in the case of Jordan Edwards, we already know that it's been found that the police officer not only killed one of our best and brightest, but also uh, lied in the retelling of the story uh, and has been fired. We'll see what happens. We'll see whether or not uh, Bat Springs ultimately says that this young man's life mattered. I think we live in a community where just those very words, and I think we live in a world, I know we do, based on my lit review, where those very words, black lives matter, are taken as such an offense by so many people. I think that carries out across the board. I think there are many people who don't understand that rather than being exclusionary, those words are an affirmation. They're an affirmation that a young man named Trayvon Martin, who was doing nothing more than going to the store and then returning with an iced tea and a packet of skills, mattered as he died unjustly, not at the hands of a police officer, but at the hands of the same kind of violence that we see repeated uh, in these police interactions and too often in our communities as well. When we say Black Lives Matter, I know you've heard this before, it doesn't mean that other lives don't matter. Someone came up with a solution and she, a white woman, said, why don't you just say Black Lives Matter too? And if I had been writing my Gazette column, she would have been the subject of my column for that day. <laughs> People often walked into that trap just by talking to me, which is what they paid me to do. Black Lives Matter, comma, too. That's what she wanted to say. And she said, why don't you put an exclamation mark behind it? So Black Lives Matter, comma, T-O-O, -O, exclamation point. And then people will be able to accept it in a much easier way. And by the way, Rosemary, can I touch your hair today? You'll think about that and get it when you get home. <laughs> You'll think about it later. Uh, the reason that we cannot say black lives must matter, comma, to exclamation point, is that that's not, an that's not an affirmation. That's not an affirmation for Trayvon Martin, for Sandra Bland, who was going to take a new job at her university. 
um, and lost her life, had her life taken away in a jail. It's not an affirmation for what we've experienced here in Colorado Springs with young people who have contributions to make being taken from us in this way. And it certainly wouldn't be an affirmation for someone like Jordan Edwards, who by every measure was the kind of young man that you want to have over uh, when he's 21, perhaps for an adult beverage. Uh, perhaps you would like to go and work out with this wonderful athlete. Perhaps he'd be a tutor for your child because he was a math whiz. Perhaps you'd just like to have him around because by every measure, he was that kind of person. His coach said he was a coach's dream. And I imagine there must be some coaches in the room or some place around. I know that my husband has coached math and science students. So when they say, you're a coach's dream, you make my job meaningful. You're the one that gets me up in the morning to prepare for whether it's a tutoring session or whether it is a team practice. You make my job meaningful to me. That's why his life mattered to his coach, uh, to his principal, to his fellow athlete, to, uh, I just saw a video, Remembrance, uh, and certainly to the rest of his community. So Black Lives Matter is not about white lives not mattering. We know that already. The history of this country says that white lives do matter in every way, in every way. Uh, but we have not yet affirmed the other. And so uh, this call that black lives would matter, as I said, is an affirmation. It's a plea, even, uh, and it's a demand that lives would matter so much that we figure out how to police all of our communities without taking the lives of so many people in certain communities. It's not easy to listen to. Uh, in some ways, I would like to stop talking about it now. But knowing that just a week ago, I wouldn't have known that Jordan Edwards lived and died, there's a call to continue to talk about it. Uh, I think not just a call for me as an NAACP peer, or even me as a black woman, or even me as a black woman of privilege whose parents sacrificed so that I would have the opportunities to end up um, being the first college graduate in my family, and then my daughter, and if she has a child, that child. Um, so it's important for me to say it, but I think for the leader in you, those who are going to take their places in government, and that's MPA graduates, must know that black lives, lives of color, LGBTQ community members, those who are differently able, those who speak languages as a first language that's not English, the whole world doesn't speak English, newsflash, the whole world doesn't speak English as a first language. I know that those of you who are leaders who will take your places in government uh, need to believe that Black Lives Matter because inclusion is going to be important to your bottom line. We already know from everything that we've learned, I believe, in this program, uh, in our interactions on this campus, uh, that diversity matters. The chancellor is transitioning or has transitioned out, and if you follow her career, her very long career, I think 20 years at this university or more, you will see increasing levels of inclusion and engagement. Because, yes, because she's a nice lady, of course. Uh, yes, because she embraces all people, of course. But also because it met the bottom line of this university and the university system. I would dare wonder what would be missing had we not been inclusive enough to have people uh, of all backgrounds who are part of this wonderful place of learning and creativity uh, and movement. We're just moving right, I mean, we're gonna be, so we're gonna be up to the Academy Boulevard exit here in a minute with UCCS. I know that it would not have grown were it not for a vision, uh, a vision of diversity and inclusion. That's why black lives must matter 
to you as leaders who will take your place uh, in government, in civic affairs, in organizations, uh, in corrections. I heard someone say earlier that they um, are employed in a corrections position. I now work as executive director at Positive Impact Colorado, uh, a reentry services program for people who are on parole in El Paso and Teller counties. Uh, and I know that embracing all of who our program participants are uh, and everything about their lives and what they've experienced in the past is important to where they'll go in the future. And I also know that if they go towards success, that's a win-win, not just for them, not just their, for their families, not just for their neighborhoods, but for all of us. Uh, in this state, we spend $6,000 roughly a year, K through 12, on our students in our public schools, about $6,000 a year. We spend about $30,000 a year to incarcerate those who are in our public and a couple of private prisons. Think about it. Education as opposed to incarceration. Black Lives Must Matter to the leader in you, not only because of diversity and inclusion, uh, not only because it's a bottom line imperative, not only because those who uh, make the real money in this world, um, and we're moved by money sometimes. I think we're moved by money. I wouldn't turn down a bunch of money, I'm just saying. <laughs> the only people who would turn down a bunch of money are the people who already have it. Um, but, those of us who hope to be able to rise and live out the American dream and possibly have a few extra dollars must, and we're leaders, must do something not just with it as collateral, uh, but as investments in ourselves and in those who are in community with us. Uh, it must matter, black lives must matter to us as leaders because we set the tone for our world. We set the tone for our classrooms. We set the tone for what happens on this campus. Who feels included and who doesn't? Who gets in the scribe or whatever the paper is now? Who gets in the official publications? Who gets the promotions? Who gets the titles? Who's the next chancellor? I don't wanna go there. <laughs> that, that's already been controversial. Uh, but all of that matters, and black lives matter along with that because of the seats of power and the sharing of power that enriches all our lives. Do something nice for someone and have them genuinely appreciate you. And you'll find yourself thinking about it, not just nice, you know what I mean, not just nice, like you dropped your pin on the floor and I bent down and picked it up. Not just that but do something that has an impact and move some of the power from your life to another person's life and see how you think about it for days, hour, hours, days, weeks. You might think about it for years to come. Your impact is powerful. It is powerful and it does matter how we live together on this third planet from the sun. And I know it matters in how we live together on this sprawling, beautiful campus in Colorado Springs, and soon to be part of it in Denver, the way we're growing. I believe that there is a moral imperative that requires that we provide equal opportunities to people of every gender, every race, every ethnicity, sexual orientation. These aspects of identity matter it matters in how good a public administrator you're going to be, or an attorney, or a compliance person, uh, an executive director. How good will you be at making sure that you're collaborative in your work, that you reach across the aisle, that everyone's at the table? Um, all of that matters as a moral imperative as we go forward. And while well, I'm struggling to read the quote, um, it's the president and CEO of General Electric who said, equally as important is the business imperative because when you bring diverse perspectives together, a diverse team is always the best team. 
and the best team is the one on which I want to be. And that's Alex Dimitri, who is the CEO of General Electric. Uh, we will take our places as CEOs and as presidents and chief executive officer, chief operating officers, whatever titles um, will come out of this room. But more than your title, your impact on the world. We know that black lives must matter in a country that for too long has said that they don't. When I was a very young girl, uh, my grandmother read a poem to me that I <coughs> internalized almost immediately and I taught it to my daughter and I hope that she'll teach it to her child and it's a Langston Hughes poem. I too sing America. I am the darker sister. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, no one will dare say to me, go eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Congratulations, MPA program. Thank you so much. For